Hey guys, welcome to the channel. We're doing another live today with Claire. Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, wherever you are. <laughs> um, we're trying to do this one uh, at a uh, earlier time during the day so that uh, we can get some people overseas that always want to try to join in on lives. And uh, we'll give them a chance here. So we're doing this one kind of early today. But uh, thank you guys for all joining us. Let's see if uh, we've got anybody in here yet. Oh, we've already got a whole bunch. We got 70 comments. We got 69 comments again, right up nice. there. Nice. <laughs> we got a hello from Israel. That's pretty awesome. Oh, wow. Look at that. And for a bunch from UK. Hello, uh, hello, fellow UK people. Oh, Apostate <laughs> Alex is on here too. If you guys Yay. haven't been over to, uh, we put his uh, a link to his channel in the description for this video. Uh, we figured he'd come up. We've heard from a ton of UK people, didn't you? Um, what didn't you hear from somebody that went to one of those schools that we showed yesterday? Yes, somebody commented that knew me from West Hoathly. I was like, oh my gosh! <laughs> so where is that in relation to Saint Hill? Like, how far away is West Hoathly? It's about 20, 30 minutes. It's a village, and honestly, I, you you know me with directions. I I'm terrible. <laughs> I won't I won't argue with that at all. <laughs> I'll have argue. to look at a map and refresh my memory because it's not good. Nice. So we're not going to do any um, super chats today if you guys uh, if you got, don't mind. We've got all kinds of people in here that usually don't get in here, so we're going to try to uh, we're going to try to let those guys uh, get in some questions. And um, yeah, okay. Sounds good to me. Um, so. I guess what we'll do is um, maybe let's recap a little bit. We'll just go right. We'll just very quickly go through what we showed yesterday, and yeah. then we'll catch up to to where we are. Is okay. That, does that work? Yes, that works. Okay, good. Let me put this picture up here. Um, are we still in there? Yeah, there we are. Okay, good. So this is this is you when you were one with your. Yes. That's the only picture you have of you and your mom and your dad all together in one picture. Yes, that's right. So my dad left Scientology two years after this picture when I was three. My mom divorced him, um, and I never had any contact with him since then. I have reconnected with his siblings, so my aunts and uncles on his side, which has been amazing. Um, so that's good. Yeah, but that's what that picture is. And, and my mom and dad were both staff at Manchester Org in England at the time this picture was taken. Okay, so this is in Manchester. This is not in St. Hill or uh, right. Sussex or yes. East Grinstead, whatever you want to call it. Um, okay, so then this is uh, West Hoathly? Yes. And that you're four? Uh, five? No, in this picture I'm five, yes. Five. Okay, more Six, West Hoathly? Yes. And more West Hoathly? Nine, I think, yeah. Okay, then this is Greenfields. Yes, and so I was... At Greenfields, after I finished West Hoathly from the age of, I think, 10 or 11 until we moved to the U.S. when I was 13. And what year was that? Uh, the year that we moved to the U.S. was 1988. Okay, good. So we're up to 1988. Okay. So now we don't have any pictures of you between this time and 1990, 1990-ish ishes. Yeah, I'll have to I'll have to work on that for another 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 time. I have a few <clears throat> that um, family members have sent me, but obviously the ones my mom had, I don't know. She's probably burned them by now. Oh, don't say that. <laughs> um. You know, so I was thinking about it. There's one other thing that um, so by this time at this picture here when I was yep. at Greenfields. So now my mom had left the Sea Organization and she was pregnant with my half sister, my first half sister. Um, and <clears throat> because she was ex, she was she had now left the Sea Org, so she was technically not in good standing as a Scientologist. So uh, we moved into a house in East Grinstead on Morton Road. Um, this small little house and she started a daycare where she was then um the way she was making money was looking after the the babies of prominent scientologists so people that had traveled to saint hill or that lived somewhere nearby that were um taking counseling or courses at 
the Scientology organization, your mom would babysit their kids. Yes, and actually concurrent to that, we she would rent out three of the rooms in our small little house to people that would were coming to East Grinstead to do their their upper levels at St. Hill. So, so they for were, example, for they, example, that's where I first met Pete Griffiths. He he rented one of those rooms. <laughs> oh, at your house. Yes. Wow. That's yeah. small world. Yeah. Okay. It really is. So your mom was basically making money off of them because they're the kids of those people she was babysitting. And then she was also letting out rooms to people that were coming to traveling there just to do courses or auditing for a few months or years or whatever. Yes. So when I was briefly chatting with apostate Alex, we were kind of comparing notes. So some of those kids were from the Kloss family, which is a, a high, a very wealthy family in, in East Grinstead that he knew from the London org and Chalmers uh, was the other family that the, their kids, when they were like one, two, three years old, my mom was ha had those kids in her daycare and in, in our teensy little house in East Grinstead. Wow. That's yeah. wild. Yeah. Okay. So then you move to, um, your mom is, uh, pregnant. You move to, uh, California. Yes. Well, so, um, so she had my sister in England. Okay. Um, Kirsten. Kirsten. Yeah. Okay. That's how Kirsten subsequently ended up playing on the softball team for UK because she Be was born in England. For the Olympics. Yeah. Well, she didn't quite make it to the Beijing Olympics, but she was one game short. But that's what they were. That's what she was trying to play for. Yes. You, she was, she was an American slash British teenager that was playing for the UK softball team to try and get an Olympic bid for them to be able to make it to the Olympics. Yes. And so, so one other story for context, because people are probably thinking by now, what the heck, like, why didn't you get as far away from Scientology as you possibly could? Well, I would have loved to, but again, I was trying to keep my mother um, but so while I was at Greenfields, we were still, um, the outcast of the children in East Grinstead, like we would get called Sino still. And, um, <clears throat> but nonetheless, we would, I would socialize with other teens in East Grinstead. And I ended up dating this, this boy dating. I mean, really I was 13, so it wasn't technically, the sad part, though, is that I was trying to pull away from Scientology, and then um, uh, this this boy who was not a Scientologist tried to rape me because he was dared oh. by his friend to... <laughs> oh, no! Oh. <laughs> Every time Claire demonetizes our videos with her words. Yeah. Okay. It's all good. It is yeah, what it is. Yeah. Sorry, honey. Yeah, anyway, I well, was that's trying horrible. To just, I was trying to just explain that um, this ended up pushing me back in to Scientology. I get it. Yeah. Okay. So is this, and this is still in England? Yep. Okay. So then what? what's the next thing? Uh, so then... Um, then when did you guys move to the States? Yeah, so my mom had, had my brother, Robbie... Also and, in England. Oh, I didn't know that. So, yes. okay, so you're still, okay, good. And you guys are living in East Grinstead this whole time. Yeah. Okay. And then, um, so my, my stepdad had a huge amount of debt from doing the OT level, the upper levels of Scientology. He had borrowed money from another Scientologist and, um, and he was doing all these things to try and pay off this debt and he was failing. So my mom and stepdad decided that they would move back to the US or move to the US. He was moving back to the US um, to try and make a bunch of money um, to pay off this debt. And um, so we start, they started planning on how we were gonna move to America to make tons of money and all this. And um, so we ended up moving to the U.S. in September, August or September 1988. Originally, we stayed with his his mom, my step-grandma, in Greenville, South Carolina for six weeks while they were kind of figuring out. He was, my stepdad was originally on 
um, had gotten into Scientology at the Atlanta org in Georgia. Okay. So he had friends there, Bob and Robbie. I don't remember their last names, but we went and visited them and he was maybe going to do something there. Anyway, he ended up um, getting a job offer from Vanessa Belmain um, at the time. Now she's Vanessa Stoller, married to Michael Stoller, who was a lawyer for, for Scientology. She opened and started the Beverly Hills Mission. And she offered my stepdad a job to be the executive director. So essentially the, the CEO. As but he was were. also the audit. He was the guy who did all the auditing as well. The Scientology counseling on people. Yes. He so, was a high level auditor and he was also um, had reached the upper levels and so forth. Yes. Yeah. So, but let's be clear. So the Beverly Hills mission um, is in Beverly Hills in, in California and it was next to like it was in not in a strip mall, but it was in like a little business area, and it was right next to a sushi restaurant and like Fogo de Chow or something like that. Yeah, it was across the street from Ed Debevix or Ed Debevix or however you say it on yeah. La Cienega Boulevard. Yeah, but it was tiny. It was like oh, yeah. it was like yeah. five rooms, right? It was like a an upstairs. Was it upstairs and downstairs? It was upstairs only. It was up so you'd walk. It wasn't even on the first floor of this building. You'd walk through a little door and you'd walk up to like the loft of, of some other business. I think it might have been that sushi restaurant. It was yes. like above it. And then it was like three or f maybe five rooms, like a, like a little teeny business. And how many people worked at the mission? <laughs> at like the start guesstimate. At the start, it was maybe three or four people. I mean, yeah. we when we so when we arrived in Los Angeles, originally we were actually staying at Vanessa's house because we had no money and nowhere to stay. So, my mom, dad, me, my and my uh, sister and brother, and by this point also my my mom was pregnant with my third sister. Well, so for somebody who's really in debt and is trying to pay off their debt, they sure do be uh, seem to be pumping out a lot of little kids that are expensive. Oh my goodness, <laughs> yes, and and of course I was the built-in babysitter. Oh my um, goodness, I couldn't even imagine. So, how old were you at this time? So you've just moved to California, yeah. and now you're you have a baby, two baby sisters, and a baby brother. Yeah, well, no, when we moved, my youngest sister hadn't been born yet. But yeah, so I was I was 13. My sister was three. Oh, she was my pregnant. Brother, my brother was one and my mom was pregnant with my second sister. OK, sister. so you're basically yeah. going to be doing a lot of babysitting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And my mom was always never very good with babies, like even from when I was 10, when my Sister well, she didn't have like, any experience eight, eight weeks old she just handed her to me because she couldn't get her to go to sleep and uh cursed it. she was crying yeah my mom was crying oh she was my just like can goodness. you help me <laughs> how old were you then i was 10 or oh 10, 10 maybe 11. Goodness. yeah so i became i i'm actually the one that figured out how to get each of them individually to be able to go to sleep i had a different approach for each of them and just became my job to get them to go well, to yeah. sleep. <laughs> That's kind of what the mom's job is supposed to be. Figure out what the kid likes. Do that. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. so my mom was, um, yeah, she was trying to figure out what she was going to do. My, and, and so, yeah, so we were opening the Beverly Hills Mission. I, I was helping with the renovations. We were getting the space ready. Like when we arrived in LA, it hadn't even officially opened yet. Oh, so it was just a building. It was <clears throat> Hugh was going to have to do all that work. Yes. So Vanessa, so, so the way it works in Scientology is when you have a mission, that's like the very, very lowest possible Scientology sort of organization. And you get what's called a mission holder. And the mission holder is the one who buys all the materials and buys the sort of like franchise license for that mission. And then all the out of all the money you make, you give a portion of it to what's called Scientology Missions International. And that's how Scientology gets their cut is Scientology has to pay. And I think they might even have to pay royalties and other stuff. But I think Spy figures all that out. But um, 
you can make for a little while there was a, a period where if you worked in a mission and you were a mission holder you could actually make some money and a lot of scientologists made a lot of money and when david miscavige sort of figured that out he shut all that down and i want to say that was in the 80s in the mid 80s he he pretty much shut all the missions down it was like no, 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 we need the money. You're not supposed to be making the money. We're supposed to be making the money. And then date coincident with that, pretty much there's not that many missions anymore. I think today, um, I don't know, the, the count is probably on one of Aaron Smith-Levin's lists on Growing Up in Scientology Channel. Um, but uh, so Hugh was the, this Vanessa Broad was, uh, Vanessa Stoller was the mission holder, but yes. she didn't spend time at the mission. No. Um, your your stepfather, Hugh, was the executive director, but he was also the chief auditor and the chief doing the council, Scientology counselor and all these other things. And there may be, have been three or four other people that worked there. Yes, that's right. And they, they very quickly established a pattern where they would have um, a lot of their... I'm like going to put this back up here just so we... Um, Oh yeah, sure. we're big, and and when we show the next picture, we'll uh, we'll do that. Uh, I'm oh, there we go. Okay, yeah. Okay, sorry about that. Go ahead. <clears throat> so um, they quickly established that they would be bringing in chiropractors from actually all over the country, and that's was their main public was chiropractors. Tommy Davis was one of their public. Um, who was he wasn't a chiropractor. Counseling. He was just a no, Beverly Hills. No, he was Hills. not a chiropractor. He was a Beverly Hills person. He was pretty much their only Beverly Hills person, I think. <laughs> okay, and then... So oh, this... no, no. There was another guy um, I just remembered, Mike Lamb. He was a famous surfer. Okay. And so he was doing courses there, doing um, studying Scientology there. So I had to do... That's the first time I did the course in Scientology that trains you on... Potential trouble source, PTSSP is what it's called. Yeah. Potential trouble source, suppressive persons, teaches you to, quote, confront and shatter suppression, unquote. So I was his twin, um, so meaning we were partnered getting through the course together. And we went and did the, um, uh, the tone scale drills that we were talking about yesterday or the day before. Um, we did those at the Beverly Center. Okay. And, and this was when I was 14 and it was memorable because um, there were a few people at the mall that were totally on to us that we were part of Scientology. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so so one of the questions you have to ask people is, what's the most obvious thing about me? And, um, and this guy said that you're from Scientology. <laughs> I was wow, like, Whoa. that's awesome. <laughs> so for those of you who don't know, when you first get into Scientology, they do have you do these courses and you sort of have to go out and confront people and you have to uh, put yourself in an uncomfortable position, uh, something that you would normally find uncomfortable. You have to do these sort of things to make it so that um, you can have things that are uncomfortable happen to you in Scientology and not react. And it's sort of this numbing thing that they do is they they shock you into numbness by doing all these things that are uncomfortable and you can't easily experience they do that on a pretty much constant basis on the lower courses in scientology so that when something uncomfortable happens you're not like freaking out on them that's okay. right the communications course is another great example of that yeah because, okay so yeah. Okay, so how? Okay, so uh, so what's the next big milestone? What happens that sort of gets you, pushes you back towards? So you weren't going, you haven't been to school yet. Now that you're in the United States, you just working right. at the mission, right? So that's right. Um, and that this is, at the mission is also when I did the purification rundown. Okay. And, at 14. And, and where did you do that? At the mission? That's right. They had a sauna on the back patio area okay. uh, up on the second floor. And so that's where I did the purification rundown with um, with a friend of mine, Cindy's oh. daughter. I did it with her. Okay. So the kids, our kids have an, a sort of uh, adopt, it's not sort of, she's their adopted grandmother 
because Claire and I both don't have, we don't talk to our mom. We haven't talked to our mom since we escaped in 2005. Um, so we basically have an adopted grandmother for the kids. And this, uh, and the where she met her was at the mission because her daughter was doing Scientology courses at the mission. And coincidentally, the woman, this woman, Cindy, is disconnected from her daughter and her, uh, so she's not able to see um, her own daughter. So Claire is sort of like her adopted daughter as well. Yes. So, and so just to talk a little bit about the purification rundown, you take, you do exercise every day, you spend five hours in the sauna and you, you take um, heavy, high doses of niacin and other vitamins and you, you increase your dosage every single day until you no longer have a reaction. Well, I, I've always had a really severe reaction to niacin, really, really bad, like crippling. Um, Yikes. <laughs> and, and the first time I had to take niacin was when we were in England, when the Chernobyl disaster happened. They made all, sci uh, all Scientologists take a formula called dianazine from L. Ron Hubbard that was supposed to handle radiation. So I already knew from back then that I had a terrible reaction to niacin. Um, but here I was supposed to get up to taking 5,000 milligrams of niacin a day at age 14. Um, and it got to the point where I was up all night sick as a dog. And then they, they did a review and said I was overrun. Uh, yeah, whatever. A meaning overrun in Scientology means that you've done one of their processes or rundowns too much beyond so, what you were supposed to. So you were done with the Purif and they just kept you going too long on it. So your body was starting to reject all of the harmful substances that you're putting into it because you're basically over overdosing on, um, on uh, supplements, on niacin and different vitamins. You're taking way too much yes. for your live. It's bad for your liver. And there's all sorts of things that um, it make this not an ideal um, thing to do to your body. Oh, so it was really, really bad. I've, I don't think I've been that... That's sick in a long time. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so I finished the Purif. Um, and meanwhile, yeah, we were, um, my my stepdad was working on getting the mission going. We found a, ha a small little house in Burbank that we moved into, two bedroom, one bathroom with all, how many of those were? Five. We were, yeah. No, we were six by then. Because my mom had had Becky. Oh, okay. She, yeah. Becky, I didn't know that. We never said that. Yeah, somewhere in there. So she had Becky in April. We arrived in in um, California in in September the year before, and she gave birth to Becky in April. So okay. we're in eight, 1989 now. But, but So it's four <laughs> kids in one room and then mom and dad in the other room? Uh, no, it was my sister and I. Kirsten and I in one room, and my mom, dad, and the two babies in the other room. Okay. Yeah. And this is in Burbank on Orange Street or Orange Drive. Catalina. Or Catalina. Catalina. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, in, but before Becky was born in January, that's when I was, they were trying to get me to go to Delphi in LA. Okay. You know, so now. Scientology school. Scientology school, yes. So I'd obviously already been in Scientology school in England. So they said, okay, we'll try and figure out how to have you go to the Scientology school in Los Angeles. Um, because at least for me growing up in Scientology, there was always this like, um, negativity surrounding public schools. Like that's where bad things happen that's where drugs are that's where this is that's where that is so that's where I learning was... a small amount of learning takes place as well uh in comparison to scientology schools yes so i was always <laughs> deathly afraid of going to public school uh. which i wish i would have gone to public school but anyway so uh, we tried to go to Delphi. They said I would have to go through some special steps because I had just turned 14. Um, and so I, and it was, bottom line is my parents could not afford it and it was too expensive. So they oh, bailed Delphi, on that idea. 
Yeah, just and just as a little thing of con point of context, I think it was Delphi was about four hundred fifty five hundred dollars a month. This is back in the nineties, so eighties and nineties. So yeah, it's, it was not cheap, and it and it wasn't accredited. So if you were gonna go, if you were gonna try to go to college and you need a transcript from Delphi to go to, you, the, Delphi would be like, oh yeah, sorry about that. Uh, so and they uh, the. They had forms. They didn't have grades. So you really couldn't exactly compare it apples to apples to other schools. But um, there was a lot of people that went there that then when they went to go apply for a college, they had to go to like a prep school or they had to kind of jump through some hoops to be able to be able to go over to college. It didn't just transfer over cleanly back. This is back in when I went there. So I don't know about now, but. Yeah. Okay, so your parents didn't get okay. So you come to the states in September. In January, you go. Okay, we're gonna have you to go to Delphi. They go. Oh, they do the tour. Delphi says, Ah, you might be too old, even though you'd already knew how to sci- uh, study in Scientology. They said that you're too old, and we can't teach you how to be able to study in Scientology. And then. Your they parents. said we would have to petition to get yeah. approval to to go. And the crazy part to me is that had I actually started, I would have met you, Christy, so Heather, you know, yeah. lots of other people at that time. Got yeah, so this is actually kind of crazy. Happened. And this is kind of crazy. I just realized that. So Mike Rinder's wife, Aaron Smith Levin's Aaron Smith Levin's wife, and myself all went to this school. Delphi, Los Angeles, that Claire tried to go to. Mm-hmm. So it's uh, it's just a little coincidental there. Okay, so they, and they also they can't afford it. Let's be fair. Even if they said you could go, you probably wouldn't have gone because yes. it was five hundred bucks a month. So, so at that point, your parents just decide, okay, just don't go to school. Well, no. So first, <clears throat> we went to, and we also went to Mace Kingsley, which was the other Scientology school in Los Angeles. So that was started by uh, uh, two different Scientology women, one Debbie Mace and the other one, I think, was Carol Kingsley. Yes. So it was called Mace Kingsley. And pretty much all the kids that couldn't all the parents that couldn't afford to send their kids to Delphi. Those kids went to Mace Kingsley it was like delphi light <laughs> and yes. really it was like it to be honest from what i've heard it was more like a ged prep school like they taught you the bare minimum you needed to know to get a ged and then you they take you to the place to do the ged test and then you get a certificate and it's like okay good you're good to go you can join the c org or you can get emancipated or not go to school it, it was a way to get out of school when you were 16 and for Scientology kids. Yes, and of course the appeal there being that then they could get sucked into the Sea Organization. Yeah. With or without a GED, they weren't particular. <laughs> yeah. But my mom my mom really, really had a thing where she was like, I really want you to get your high school diploma. So I think that was kind of her way of pr- trying to protect me from joining the Sea Organization, failing to do so. Um, but so, and so also, Having come from England, I'd already done the student hat, which is one of the bigger, the biggest course in Scientology that teaches study technology. And so I was a prime candidate already. I signed a CERC contract the first time when I was seven years old. Then I signed another one when I was 12. I signed another one when I was 13. So from the moment we arrived in California and kind of started meeting uh, going into the Scientology orgs, the recruiters were all over me from the get-go. Yeah, so in if you are the child of a Scientologist and you've gone to a Scientology school or you have any sort of Scientology schooling, um, they're very you're very valuable to the Sea Organization because they can't get people can't join the Sea Org that can't study Scientology that that. They fail miserably, and they usually just end up kicking them out. So if you've got a kid that's been indoctrinated in Scientology, it's very easy for them to integrate into the Sea Org because the Sea Org is just uh, 24-7 Scientology. That's really what it is. Yep. Um, So, 
Yeah. So, okay. So keep going. So the recruiters are hounding you signed all these contracts. Oh, and that's the sort of thing they do. They get kids to sign contracts when they're seven, 10, 11, 12, 13. And then later on, <clears throat> excuse me, when they're like 14 or 15, they're like, Hey, it's time for you to fulfill your contract. And they basically, they guilt the kids and they guilt the parents. If you, if you don't join, then they guilt the parents into punishing you because you uh, said you made it a commitment to join the C organization and now you're not honoring your commitment. So you're an enemy to Scientology and you have to do, they have a lower condition. They have these lower conditions there and they, the lowest you can be is in confusion. And then the next one out is, was what is doubt? Treason. No, treason. treason. Yeah, which is betrayal after trust. Yeah. And so that's what they would assign you. They'd assign you treason. And then it after was, you do treason. It was treason. confusion, treason, enemy. Yes. <laughs> when you're yeah. acting as a, an enemy, as yeah. it says. And then doubt. Doubt. When you can't make up your mind between two groups. And, and then, then liability. Liability, yeah, when you have to uh, get get approved to re-enter the group. And liability is the top of the lower conditions. So once you get if and each for each one of these conditions, you have to do um, punishments and then you have to do reparations and once you or amends. And once you for each one of the of these conditions, there's a formula and it's these steps. And if you do those steps and you petition, then somebody, the boss of you, or in our cases, our parents, because when you're in a Scientology kid, you have to do these conditions that yes. L. Ron Hubbard's laid out. So if, you're par if you get in trouble with your parents and they assign you conditions, you kind of have to work your way back up. So, but liability, and, and, don't, and don't forget that part of the 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 conditions is also writing up your overts and withholds, your transgressions, yes. which your parents are like, "Yep, give us a confession." Yeah, and yeah, and I've been doing lower conditions since I was six. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, but liability is sort of the gate to freedom. So, if you're in liability or below pretty much universally in the Sea Org and Scientology, wherever you're, however you orbit in the Scientology universe, um, once you get out of liability, then you can like have breaks and go on to have a day off or go play with your friends or whatever, whatever position you are in Scientology. Um, once you get out of liability, then you're in these what's called uh, upper conditions or like uh, what do they call them? Just conditions. There's just conditions yeah. and then there's lowered conditions. And you don't want to be, if you're in Scientology, you don't want to be in lowered conditions. That's sort of like, it's not, um, it's not jail. It's like probation in Scientology. Yeah. When you get I, lower I conditions, think... <laughs> you're on probation. And if, I, and if, and yeah. if anything bad happens, you could very quickly go to jail and other places. Yeah, I think uh, it's fair to say that in Scientology, the conditions are the substitute of parenting. Oh, one hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like well, after and after liability, because then you have to. Then you're in non-existence. Then yeah. you have to find out what's needed and wanted from you, and that's when your parents just download. On like, yeah, here's what here's what I need and want from you. Yeah, it's <laughs> you so ridiculous. It <laughs> it's so ridiculous. And yes, and, and there's people losing their mind in the comments. They make young. They make uh, minors sign contracts. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and that's one of the funny things is they get all these kids to sign all these contracts. And also other agreements, release forms, NDAs, non-disparagement clauses, all of these things. Mm -hmm. You don't get any copies. You don't have a lawyer. You're 14. What, are you going to bring your lawyer over to sign some contracts at the C oh, organization? I don't, I, don't think, I don't think they would, e would even let you bring a lawyer. No, if they wouldn't. you even knew to ask for one. No. I mean, what 14-year-old knows to ask for a lawyer? If you signed all these things to say, uh, can I please uh, have a copy for my lawyer? <laughs> <laughs> be like, what? <laughs> Get out of here. You're out. Um, no, so, but then years. That, that's, that's why I so uh, meticulously read contracts. Oh, yeah. Now. Claire's a contract <laughs> reader now. Um, but uh, 
when uh like years later when you go to escape or you go to you go to tell expose them they're like well you signed all these contracts make yeah the, this kid was 14 when he signed all those those don't mean anything it's ridiculous yeah. okay so they're so what as sooner or later they get you to sign one of these contracts yeah but and so we were so this is so you know for context i'm being hounded by recruiters my parents are trying to figure out what to do with me we visit delphi mace kingsley Eventually, they just, my parents decide that they just can't afford to send me to Scientology school. So my mom got a copy of the curriculum from Mace Kingsley, and her brilliant idea was that she was just going to send me to the library. Because after all, I, I was a graduate of the student hat, so I could study no problem. And so I would just um, go to the local library in Burbank by myself for two or three hours a day, and I would just pick a subject off the curriculum and study it out of encyclopedias and then write an essay for my mom <laughs> and then go back home. So that's how I studied about Christopher Columbus and Ferdinand Magellan. And okay, but this is also <laughs> at that Burb that library in Burbank. Yes. Okay, so, so, so we, okay, we'll just remember that just remember the Bur library in Burbank, people. Just yes. remember that. It's going to come up later. Okay, good. So go ahead. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So now I'm studying solo, basically teaching myself American curriculum. Because also, too, it was very different. English school, you're learning about the Tudors and the Stuarts and the Battle of Hastings and, you know, all this other stuff. And it's just completely different in the U.S. But... I was I was really happy to be in America. I was really happy to be out of the cadet org, and I had kind of had this idea in my mind that this would be a fresh start and preferably nothing to do with Scientology. But obviously, that that part never happened. Um, so and yeah. So and let's be fair. Your mom, it, whatever she's checking, she doesn't know the right answers. She no. was. She was a, she was barely educated, and she also didn't know American history as you know as well as you would. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No, so she had you, no credentials. She didn't even finish her O level or uh, what's it? I think it's called O levels in England. But but I'm just saying there wasn't a lot of uh, educational supervision happening here. No, there was not. <laughs> she, and, and I was actually kind of sad because she didn't even read my essays. <laughs> I'd put so much work into that's what I'm life. saying she's just like okay good job <laughs> yeah and also I was reading books um and again there it's very different America um you know so I read the yearling and I was re whatever um John Steinbeck and just reading all these these uh, American literature compared to in England obviously it's Charles Dickens and you know whatever uh okay. so I was reading reading books and writing essays was my self-inflicted education with no supervision wow okay so when do you get to the sea hork uh well and so okay um so during this time i was doing courses at valley org which was in north hollywood okay oh so you because you live in burbank which is right next door to West, uh, north hollywood Yes. Okay. So I would I would study at the library in the morning. I would babysit my brother and sisters in the afternoon, and then in the evening I would go and do courses at the at the Valley Org, and that's where I first did the professional TRS course. The the ultra that's training routines. That's training basically routines. where you do the confronting and experiencing all these uncomfortable things. Yes, exactly, and. Um, and then I also did what's called method one, where you clear all words on all subjects that you've ever not understood until you uh, are cleared of all misunderstood words, basically. I think okay. that's a good, a good summary. Okay. Um, so now I was fast flow by this point. So that meant I didn't have to get so many um, rigorous in checkouts where they ask you definitions of words and ask you concepts in Scientology and ask you to do all these extra steps. You're kind of now a, a faster student. And, um, <clears throat> and so now I, um, I started going, I moved over and started doing, going to the celebrity center. And how do you move from the Valley org to the celebrity center as a 14 year old? Um, because my, my, um, 
my stepdad had was had a bunch of training awards. So if, in so instead of paying me for babysitting, they gave me training awards. Okay, so in Scientology, <laughs> if you get somebody else onto a course, and I think if you pay for a certain amount of courses as like a block, then you get these things that are called uh, training awards. It's basically Scientology funny money. So coupons, Scientology yeah. coupons. Well, yeah. it doesn't. It's not real. You can't buy anything else with it. But it kind of it it goes on your account. You don't get a lot at a time, but if you do a lot of different things over many many years, it could add up to enough to pay for a kid to do some course, your kid to do some courses or to buy some books or something like that. You, it's sort it's sort of a a weird com commodity that's traded within Scientology, and you can you can sort of gift people training awards too. So like if and it's a way for the organizations to get something done and to receive some money, even though they're not getting anything done and they're not getting any money. But either way, okay, so instead of paying you cold hard cash for the hundreds of hours of babysitting, they were giving you Scientology funny money. <laughs> That's right. That's oh right. My yeah. Goodness. And and I had some friends, like for example, Cindy's daughter Kara was was doing her training now at Celebrity Center. So I wanted to go there and and you know the I, I had the idea of Celebrity Center of the allure of the celebrities and that was you know anyway, so I I, I got my parents to buy me my academy levels which is the the levels where you become trained in how to administer scientology counseling okay so can't yeah so you're you're that's where you practice you need a guinea pig or you need somebody to practice with yeah and in scientology they have this thing called a twin and that's your study partner and if you do a, a counseling course and you have a twin you both study it at the exact same time and they at the exact same section and then you audit each other so you practice on them and then they practice on you and so you're each other's guinea pig uh, and uh, that way if you mess somebody up it's the guy that you've been working with all this time yes and also around this time i they moved me over so i stopped doing my self library study and i started going to an ot8 like an upper level scientologist house in Linda the Hollywood Nielsen. Hills, Linda Nielsen. She oh. had a, she had the learning connection, and that's where I met Marissa Rabisi. Wow! So this is where small worlds collide. Marissa Rabisi was my first girlfriend. That's Bonnie yes. Rabisi's sister. He's a Hollywood actor, but they also lived in the Valley. And Vonnie and Marissa also used to both go to the Delphi Academy um, when we were all little kids. Okay, so you and Linda Nielsen, to be clear, that is 100% a GED prep mill. So you you study exactly for the GED test, and then that's what you get as a GED, right? Yes, yeah, and there were a few other Scientologist kids, like the the um, uh, the singer, the opera singer, her kids went there. Julia McGinnis Johnson, yes, Justina, right. and uh, Mar uh, Marissa, I think it was. I think another a Melissa or Marissa, but yes, okay. Yeah, Judd Posner also went there. Okay. Um. Anyway. Um. And and yeah, we went on a ski trip one time with Vani. So I, I had a massive crush on him at the time. I was like, Oh, that would have been weird. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> we, we both tapped into the Rabisi family. <laughs> Like you said, small worlds collide. It is. Either way, um, so yeah, so yeah, I was um, going there in the morning, babysitting, um, and I was did um, so. I did the academy level training, and so that's where I first learned to do what's called security checking in Scientology, where you're interrogating people for all manner of <sighs> crimes, sexual. Well. But you're what, you're 14, 15 at this point? Yeah, I was 14, yeah. 14. So yeah, when you when you're a, when you're a young girl in Scientology and you become a sex checker, 
which for some reason, a majority of the security checkers in Scientology are young girls. Especially um, in re in Religious Technology Center. Well, as, oh yeah. yeah, we're gonna show a picture later on, guys. <laughs> You're, it's gonna it's gonna be a little bit heavy on the uh, hormone, uh, the uh, the estrogen on there. <laughs> um, okay, so. Um, and so, okay, so now you're at Celebrity Center. You're learning how to do a sec checks. Now, now what? Next what? And so more and more heavy during this p period was I was getting recruited all the time. That's when Tommy Davis was trying to recruit me. John Peeler was trying to recruit me. He's now an ex-Scientologist that we know. Um, and <clears throat> eventually... Uh, Linda Rule and Tammy Lundeen um, were on a mission, which is it, basically they were assigned a task and they were just doing that full time. They were recruiting people into the SEER organization to join the Superpower team. So Superpower is the rundowns L. Ron Hubbard created for staff that they were supposed to receive when an organization reached the size of St. Hill. So when they expanded and the staff worked really hard, then they would be awarded with the superpower rundowns. Um, and someone was asking about why the superpower rundowns are used for ethics or something like that. Um, they were originally developed to handle people who were wanted to leave Scientology and all other manner of things. And, especially the cause resurgence rundown where you're running around the pole was essentially a reprogram to just wear you down and make you rede rededicate your life to Scientology. Anyway, either way. So I, I ended up, uh, they, they, Linda and Tammy finally got me to agree to join the C organization. Okay. The way they did that, which I think we talked about. We did already. Yeah. It's in okay. the first video. Perfect. So we won't recover that. Okay. Um, so I did the Estates Project Force in Los Angeles at the Big Blue Buildings at the Pack Base. So that it's at uh, Sunset and Vermont area, Vermont ish, like Sunset and Edgemont in Hollywood. There's a big giant blue building which has that big white Scientology sign. That's usually the the building most people see when they see a picture of Scientology in a TV show or a movie. And so you started there, and that's where you did the Estates Project Force, which is like a, a Sea Org boot camp for uh, in intake of new Sea Org members have to go through this. And if you're not a good student, a good Scientology student, the EPF could take you months and months and months. But if you're a good student, you can do it in how long? How long did you do it in, Claire? Two to three weeks. There you go. You could yeah, do it in two to three weeks. But it was so sad. Like the the night my parents dropped me off at the at the at pack, I had my comforter, my little bag. I was crying. <laughs> and how old were you at this point? Sixteen. You were sixteen, and you had a bag, and you were crying when they dropped you off. Yes. Holy moly. <laughs> <laughs> oh. And of course, we didn't have cell phones then. This was 1991. Oh and yeah, there was a payphone. There was a payphone. See, phone. I wouldn't want to be you. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> See you later, Claire. Good having you. I think you did almost... some good babysitting, but uh, there you go. I guess we'll have to get another babysitter. Yeah, Sixteen. At, at You're least... on your own. At least for the first few days, I would go to the payphone and call my mom crying. <sighs> <laughs> oh my god, this is in Hollywood. And and okay, but to be fair, your parents lived like 15 minutes away. Yes. So, at the end of the if it was the end of the world, he would pick me up. Ugh. Yeah, and the sad part too was that my mom was just like, "No, you're strong. You can do this. You're oh. stronger than I ever was." And I'm like, it, "No, I'm not." By the way, <laughs> Stepfather, not qualified to be in the Sea Org. No. Mom already was in the Sea Org, failed miserably, and had to get out of there. So now they're saying, you can do it, you can do it. And 16, that's it. You're on your own. We're proud of you. You got this. You know, um, yeah. Okay, so, so, and, and so you do your EPF in a few weeks, and then where do you end up? Then I work, um, I, so I graduate the EPF. 
I end up working at the Hollywood Guarantee Building on Hollywood Boulevard, which okay. is where at the time the middle management of Scientology was. Yeah, so it still is. Yeah, and so it's called the Hollywood Guarantee Building or the HGB. Yeah, and that's where that Scientology Missions International, that group that's supposed to kind of wrangle the missions, that's where they are. There's another group called WISE, the World Institute of Scientology Enterprise, and that's the C organization that's supposed to round up all the Scientologists that have businesses and get a cut from them and their business. And then there, that's where ABLE was at the time, the Association for Better Living and Education. And they're the ones that are supposed to round up Narconon, Way to Happiness, Applied Scholastics, and Criminon. And then you have, at the time, and it's, the names have changed, um, it was called the Flag Command Bureau. It was called the Flag Liaison Office. And I think now they call it the International Liaison Office. And they are the ones that basic they round up all the information from all the different continents and they tally it and compile it and then they send that up to upper management. So the so an upper management is the imp base. So you have the imp base, which is CMO, the Commodore's Messenger Organization, and all these high level Scientology organizations. And they send orders down to middle management or the international liaison office. And then they send everything out to the continents and then yes. the continents uh, manage the individual orgs in their continent. Okay. So you're working there and, and Oh, there's one other place that's also at that building, which is the international training organization. Yes. And they're responsible. They used to be, that's a good question. I'm not exactly sure how that works now. They kind of perverted that whole system, but if you were going to go and manage an organization or you were going to train to go out to a continent, you would do your training, your Scientology administration training at the ITO, the International Training Organization. And now I think they do most of that at, at, in Florida at FLAG. Um, so they don't, I don't, that's, there's a little bit of uh, hooey going on in there in Scientology <laughs> on why they do it certain ways. There's okay. lots of hooey. <laughs> there's a lot of hooey. And then there's also, let's not forget, that's also at this HGB 6331 Hollywood Boulevard 90028. That's where, um, Hollywood, California, that's where Office of Special Affairs is. Hey, Osa, everybody give a shout out to Osa. Shout out to Osa. Osa. To help you get out. Osa, Osa. In the house. So there's people from the Office <laughs> of Special Affairs. They watch all these videos, they transcribe them. And then whenever we say Xenu or Lord Xenu or Xenu is my homeboy or Team Xenu or any of that stuff, hashtag hot volcanoes, um, if we do any of that stuff, they actually black it out and they say uh, squirrel and theta. <laughs> That's actually, it's coming up in some of the spy documents where I was talking about Xenu and they're like squirrel data, squirrel data, squirrel yeah. data, and it's redacted. Anyway, but... Um, Okay, so and also that is where um, L. Ron Hubbard has an office, and in his office there's this giant thing on the first floor called the L. Ron Hubbard Life Exhibition, and then um, that's RTC Religious Technology Center has an office there, yes, and the Commodore's Message, the Commodore's Messenger Organization International Extension Unit. <laughs> CMO IXU has an office there as well. Yes, that's right. Okay, did I miss anything? I probably missed like 17 other little tiny organizations. But either way, you went to work there, and which one of those did you work at? Or were you doing something at? Yeah, so I, I was um, I was under ITO, the, the training org. Okay, because um, you were, oh, because you were going to be a supervisor or some kind of person that was going to be involved with superpower. Yes, I was going to be a superpower auditor, counselor. Okay, counselor. Yeah. Okay, good. So, so the first thing, um, the first courses that I was assigned to do, which I was put on full time training to do, in the um, anyway, were, were the key to life course and the life orientation course. So I was and, doing those full time. And the key to life course is you basically just work up, you look up it 
as to a you look up all every you clear every single definition of every single small common word and this could take months and months and months and you do it every single day you just look up words in dictionaries and it's scientology dictionaries the only benefit that i will say that i attribute to spending so many hours in a dictionary is it taught me how to lose my british accent yes that's true. because it was when i was doing the key to life course that i was looking at the word uh walk w-a-l-k in the dictionary and i was looking at it going walk walk and then the twin the person i was doing this word clearing with i was looking at the pronunciation it said w-o-k and i was like walk that can't be right and he was like you're saying it right you're saying it right (laughs) i was like oh my goodness Anyway, so yeah, so I did Key to Life full-time and I did Life Orientation course full-time. During this, um, there was a lady by the name of Pat Bromley uh, who was recruiting people from the HGB to now go to the upper, to the gold base. Yeah, now, and one real quick thing is, this is a, it's a kind of a loophole in Scientology, but... If you are in training for an organization, you're not actually at that organization. And in order for somebody to move, um, Scientology is the most giant bureaucracy in the entire universe. But in order for one person to move to another position or to another organization, somebody else has to take their place. So it's like a constant game of chess and checkers in Scientology and so if you want to take somebody from an or another organization you have to put another person into that position or that organization and if you're training you're not really you're not really qualified to do anything or be anywhere and if somebody takes you they can just get another person that's training even though they might not be qualified for something or it's just a it's a system but because you were in training, you are particularly vulnerable to be swiped because they don't really have to replace you. Yes. Okay, so you get snatched. And Pat Bromley, so everybody knows, Pat Bromley was a Sea Org member from the Ant Base. And she was working in the qualifications division of Golden Era Productions. So, yes. And Golden Era Productions... Um, is the organization at the international headquarters that provides counseling and training to all of the other international organizations. So there's about 10 different organizations at the Ant Base, and Golden Era Productions is the lowest one, and it provides the training to all of them. Yes, that's even, right. Including RTC. That's right. Yeah. Yes. It's like, so, so like in the at the Ant Base... You could be in the course room as a Golden Era staff member, which is like the lowest of the lowest. And you could be sitting right next to somebody from a religious technology center that works for David Miscavige, like that's his assistant. And so you kind of have the, the, the lower, the worker class mingling with the upper crust in Scientology <laughs> management. Okay. Yes. So, yeah. so, so, so Pat Bromley comes for you. Yeah, Pat Bromley, so she, and and we already covered a a lot of those details about how my mom signed over guardianship of me. and Perfect, yeah, we did that in the first video. Yeah, and so, and and again, my mom did not, she was not allowed to know where the headquarters was, so not only did she sign over guardianship of me, but she had no idea where I was going to be working. And, um, And so, anyway, I ended up getting approved and got driven to... Hemet on a Sunday morning by Anna Kirsten Ershkoff. She was a, an, a counselor in Golden Era at the time. And she drove me to the base. Uh, and that was the first. My So now I, now I was um, at Golden Era Productions. That's where I met you. And okay, so when did you arrive at, at Gold? September 1991. So I joined the Sea Organization in July 1991. Yeah. And now this was September 1991. And I arrived at the headquarters. 
And you worked in the qualifications division, the counseling division for the whole base. Yeah, because I had just finished the Key to Life and Life Orientation course, I was um, put through uh, the supervisor training, which is the training that teaches you how to administer Hubbard's courses and training to staff members. And I became, at first, the Key to Life and Life Orientation course supervisor. So every day staff would have two and a half hours study time and I would be overseeing that. And also because you were in the training and counseling division of Golden Era Productions, it was encouraged that you do training and counseling because the higher you are trained or counseled, the higher you can train and counsel people on various parts of the bridge to total freedom. So the OT levels and all these different higher up counseling levels, if you haven't done the training or done the counseling for those levels, then you can't um, oversee or do any repairs or other counseling on other people that are at that level. Right. So like if, so if you, if there's a, uh, a CREG member that's OT level seven and you're OT level three, you can't do counseling on that person. That's right. Okay. Yes. So that's the reason why the, and not a lot of Scientologists or not a lot of Sea Org members actually do get higher training or counseling. Like, for instance, I have never even read Dianetics and I never went clear. And the only really auditing that I got was from Tom Cruise. So um, I, ba I barely have like I have like um, like student auditor auditing is the auditing that I've gotten. Yes, I got yeah, the they, low. They, I got the low grades, the, the cheap yeah, stuff. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. They have the um, when you're learning to become a counselor, they have what they call quad grades. It's just like the re super baby abbreviated version. Yes, um, that's right. It's yeah. it's not even it's it's like it's Scientology light. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Very light. <laughs> like you got through that in maybe five or six hours. So I had done those too. And it was during my time on the, the key to life and life orientation course, uh, the life orientation course team when I was a supervisor that, um, I attested to the state of clear because I was quote unquote found to have been a clear last lifetime oh you were a last life clear <laughs> yes oh my goodness what a and, and this for, is all so much nonsense <laughs> i know and, and so for the people watching who are going wait a minute mark you didn't know that i was last. well i knew you were clear? clear but who cares how you got clear because it's all nonsense right and we were not allowed to talk about it oh yeah you're not allowed to say anything about your counseling to other people yeah. Um, it doesn't matter who they are. You're not. It's in Scientology. It's like it's a crime or it's illegal to. They call your counseling or what happens in your counseling. They call that your case, and you're not allowed to discuss your case with other people. Yes. And additionally, <laughs> if something is going on in your case, like if you. Like, let's say you're doing some auditing and you're getting upset or you're getting emotional or something's going wrong with your counseling. When you're a Sea Org member and you go back to work, you're not allowed to have case on post. So if you're if you think you're about to commit commit unaliving and, and the horrible things are happening, when you get to post, you have to be like, do do do. <laughs> Everything is awesome. And you Everything have to pretend awesome. like nothing's going on otherwise you can get in trouble for having case on post so okay so now you're in so this is okay we have pictures now so yes. now we meet in 1991 and the main reason we meet is because i have to do those two courses the key yes. to life and the life orientation course i have to do those um, right after I finish my Tom Cruise auditing, I then have to go and do those two courses and you're the supervisor. So basically I would see you every night. That's right. And, and, also, and do you remember and, that and also I gave you, you, were I gave one you of, a review session one time? Do you remember that? I do. Um, <laughs> but, but also I was going to say we were, you were 16 when you arrived there, right? Or 16 yes. or 17. No, I was 16. You were 16. So, and I was 
19. So you were one of the very few young people that were there. We were, there wasn't a lot of us. There was maybe, I'd say about 10 or 15 kids that were from like 14 to 20. Yeah. That we were all the kind of young teenagers at the international headquarters. And um, it was also around this time, speaking of that, where um, I got in a lot of trouble and I was told that I was a black widow because, well, uh, yeah. yeah, because yeah. Ken Hoden, who is like oh, in his forties. Okay. Now watch out because you're like the demonetization. You're the demo, the I didn't demo say girl. Anything. I, didn't I know what I'm just saying. You're venturing into sensitive territories. So basically what would happen is at the international headquarters, you got these young girls showing up. There's a whole bunch of old single fuddy duddies been floating around that property for maybe even decades. And then these young, this not, these young girls show up and some of these men would have thoughts. And when they would do their counseling, they would have to confess to those thoughts. And if multiple men confessed about thoughts and it was all about the same person, then usually Dave, it would get on Dave Miscavige's radar and then he would declare that girl like a black widow, like she's sucking in all the attention of all the males. Yeah. And 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 I'm tell me if I'm exaggerating. Many times those black widows were assigned to go off to some other place because they were distracting too many men. Yes, that's right. And so I will be very careful about the words that I use, and I'll cover it when I eventually write my book, hopefully this year. <laughs> But the creepiest one was this guy in his 40s, and he convinced me to go ride on the bus home with him, and nothing happened. But the, the weirdest thing was he said, you know, again, he's like 25 years older than me. I'm 16. Yeah. He said, oh, can I give you a kiss? And I said, uh, okay. And he held out his hand, and he had a chocolate kiss, and I was like, oh, <laughs> on that one. <laughs> Wow. Oh my goodness, Claire. Uh, it's horrible. See, I didn't Can say I give you bad. a kiss. It gives you a little chocolate cover, a little foil wrapped, a little chocolate called a kiss, a Hershey's kiss. Yeah. Anyhow, oh my goodness. Yeah. So it was crazy. But, but, and again, I'll be very careful about what I say here, but. One of the functions I had to do at this time, again, I'm 16, was on the life orientation course, you had to do 21 different extensive uh, confessions. You had to write up all your overts and withholds on all areas of your life. And so this and, and so I would have to sit in front of the person and read their whole confession. And then I would put them on the e-meter with the holding the electrodes and I would have to ask them questions like, have you told all? Is there something that's incomplete about this? You know, questions like that. And I would have to, if there was any reaction on the, on the e-meter, then I would send them back to write more. And so I had to read all kinds of things um, that were none of my business at 16. That's where yeah. I learned a lot of crap that... No 16-year-old should be reading about from 40-year-old, 50-year-old men, women, whatever. I mean, it was really bad. And sometimes those thoughts were about you that you'd have to read yes. from the men. Yes, with them sitting in front of me watching yeah. me read it. Yeah. Oh, so, my goodness. So the way it would work is you would you would write your confessions in the in the course room in the yes. in the study hall there would be people right next to you and you'd just be writing all these confessions right next to other students and other people that are also writing the same stuff and then if you had some thoughts about claire and you were a 52 year old dude you'd write all those thoughts and then you'd give it to claire because claire's the one that has to read them and then do a little interview with you on the e-meter and make sure that that's all the thoughts you had and you're reading the thoughts they're having about you and then you sit down at a desk with them and then you have to talk to them about those thoughts. It was so And that bad. is a re I, I somebody corrected me. I said that's a normal thing in Scientology. It's not a normal thing. It's a regular thing in Scientology. Yes. There's nothing normal about it whatsoever. No, there is not. Okay. Um, yes. Yeah. And that, I'm going to bring up the picture now. Okay. 
And that is when Claire and I meet up. And so then this is what happens when that happens. So that's yes. Claire and that's me. And this is in 1992. Yes, because this was after we were married, actually. Yeah. Um, but, and this but, was one but, of the, like six the Christmas, months. This was one of the staged Christmas photos that they yes. had us do to send to our family to see, to be like, Merry Christmas. Everything's That's right. It's wonderful. Yeah. So Claire in this picture is 17. Yes. And I'm 19. Yes. Well, yeah. No, I'm 19. And this was at Christmas time in 1992, I want to say. Yes. Okay, and so at this time you're still in qual. And then um, let's see what the next one is. Okay, so now we're going to jump forward a little bit, if you don't mind. Yes, that's okay. So this is 1996. Yes, and I'm on the far left. Yeah, so there's, I want, I want to say there's 19 people in this picture, maybe 20. Um, and Claire is on the far, far side on the left. Well, the way we're looking at it, I don't know if it's flipped for you guys, but all the way on the left is Claire. And then there's a dude. His name is Eric. And he's standing next to her. He's the only dude in that picture. Yes. <laughs> Those are all women. And most of them, I'd say, are under 30. And, yes. and, then, and then the ones that are under 30, most of them are under 25, right? Yes. Like I, in, in this picture, I was 21. Okay, and yeah, and most of the other, like Eric and Melanie and a bunch of those girls are all in their 20s too, for the most part. There's a, yes. few, a few older gals in there. Okay, so now at this time, this is you're at Florida. Yes, and I'm now, in Clearwater, Florida. And now, and now you're in Religious Technology Center. Yes, I've been so, promoted so tell us about to that. Religious Technology Center. And all the people in this group were training to become RTC representatives, which meant that we were going to be positioned like there was going to be RTC offices in UK, Euro uh, Europe, um, PAC, which is Los Angeles. The Pacific Area Command is what yep. PAC stands for. Yes. Um, Celebrity Center um, at FLAG. In Clearwater, there was going to be an RTC office. There already was an RTC office at Flag, but they were they were going to be expanded, and there was going to be one at um, Middle Management at in Hollywood at the Hollywood Guarantee Building. Anyway, so all of these people were training to become RTC representatives, and we were <clears throat> we were being all run and trained by Sue Gentry Wilhair, who's dead center in the middle. And she was the he she was the head of the RTC office in Clearwater at the time, and Anne Rathbun, Marty's ex Marty Rathbun's ex wife, is also in this picture with the dark curly hair, and she was um, also in charge of us. So basically, they were all they were running us on all different things. But and funnily yeah. enough, so Anne at Rath this time Anne Rathbun is eight from the right if anyone wants to freeze frame it she's the eighth one in from the right we might want to we might do a, a video just on this picture and say and just ask claire okay who's this person where did they go who's this person where did they end up and we'll do that we'll deep dive into this picture because there there's about <laughs> there might even be three or four videos with the stories of the people in these pictures there really but, are but yeah. let me show the next picture because it's right around the same time. So at this time is when you guys had finished all your training as RTC trainees and you're just about to go start going out places. Yeah, so the, and so read the caption there. It says Inspector General Representatives soon to be operating, I can't read the rest. In every a advanced organization St. Hill and Celebrity Center International. Yes, and so my I was being trained to be the Celebrity Center RTC representative, which yeah, we, we talked, talked about, about the other that. day. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So let's show the next picture. The next picture, and now this is <clears throat> in the world of coincidences, it doesn't get any more crazy than this. No. This is a picture of an event where David Miscavige, this is a different, it's around the same time, but it's a different day where David Miscavige presented all of these religious technology new representatives to the public at 
in Florida in Clearwater. And was this at the Flag um, Land Base Auditorium? Yes, so, in the Fort Harrison Hotel. Yeah, and so this so is in the Flag Auditorium. And someone, this is David Miscavige and Shelly Miscavige in the middle of this picture. Yes. And then all of the same people that were in that spread out picture are on either side of Dave and Shelly. Now, this was taken by someone in the audience at that event. And it was an unauthorized picture. You're not supposed to take pictures like this. But the person who took the picture sent it to us. So that's how we have this picture. But the person who took the picture was Aaron Smith Levin from Growing Up in Scientology. <laughs> yes, I had never seen this picture until we, um, until when until Aaron, Aaron, sent, Aaron it sent it to us. To us. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But yeah, so that's what. So this was 1996. I think this was May, if I'm not mistaken, May 1996, and Aaron took this picture. Crazy. So crazy. So crazy. Yeah, and that's when I first met Aaron because Aaron was doing training in Clearwater, and so and that's so you were the boss of Aaron. Yeah, you were one of the people that would go around, and he would have to get approval from somebody in RTC to pass to the next level of training. Yeah, and because and I was in Religious Technology Center, he had to call me Sir or Mister Headley. Yes. <laughs> Okay, so are there any other stories you want to tell at, that happened in this before we go to the next picture? Uh, no. Okay. Cool. There's, well, so that's how Aaron, this is where Claire met Aaron for the first time. Yes, 1996. Okay, now this is awesome. <laughs> okay, so this picture is, uh, let's say... In the 2000s now, we fast yeah. forwarded a bunch. We did. So we went about another 10, almost 10 years into the future. So if that last one was 1996, this was probably 2004-ish. Yeah, 2000, yeah. 2003. I, I, I would say this was December 2003. And by yes. this time, I was a top executive in Religious Technology Center. Technically, I was number three. So you let's were, just observe. You were the I, internal, exe your, your post was internal executive RTC. Yeah, and at this time was when I had lost dining privileges because Marty Rathbun had escaped. So I'd lost uh, at least 30 pounds. The reason my eyebrows are so high and my eyes are so small is because I'd had maybe two hours of sleep. So I was trying to stay awake. I don't think I'd seen you in like six months. I had been restricted to the property, <laughs> so, so I wasn't allowed to go home. Um, I wasn't allowed to eat with uh, the other crew, and we were on different meal breaks, meal schedules anyway, but you weren't allowed to eat with the crew either. So even if we both went to meal at the same time, we wouldn't have seen each other because we weren't allowed to eat with other people. This, this picture truly epitomizes don't judge a book by its cover. Yeah, and also <laughs> we hadn't seen each other in six months like yes. we had not spoken or talked to each other or seen each other in person in at least six months and i had to text you or uh, chirp you on the the nextel chirp phones and say hey um we have to do pictures because we have to do pictures that's the one thing it's the one form of communication we have with our families every year is that we send them a picture of ourselves and um, and you were like, okay, I, I'll meet you for ten minutes in the in the dining hall. And we went, we took a picture. I was like, how's it been? You're like, well, have you sorted your shit out yet? Like, nope, I'm still restricted. You'd be like, okay, fucker, see you later. <laughs> I never said that. I never said that. I I do remember though. One of the funniest was when I first got into RTC. Well, first of all, David Miscavige for five years was constantly. I'm going to take it down because we look so horrible. I know. We really do. It's awful. Uh, I, look, I look like I'm like, <laughs> ugh. Anyway, but he was constantly trying to make me divorce you. Yes. And constantly. that's the reason why you eventually, so let's, okay, so that was 2003. Yeah. And um, December. And then when does, I love somebody just mentioned it because I'm going to put it up. Okay. Denver Stevo. He says, Hi, Denver Stevo. Claire, why were you punished for Marty escaping? What was his link to you at the time? So he, Marty escaped from the international headquarters mid-2004. 
Yeah, and there was a few reasons that I got yeah. in trouble for that. Number one, I was the internal executive. So I was kind of over managing staff morale, staff training, staff counseling. So it was considered that had I done my job, Marty wouldn't have escaped. Number one. Number two, I had um, interrogated him a few different times at the orders of Shelley Miscavige. And so it was considered that I'd missed the boat because he didn't tell me that he was planning to escape. Number three, he was my direct boss at the time. Um, <clears throat> so I reported to him. And as it happened, I was also the last person he talked to before he drove out the, the gate and escaped down the highway. So somehow I guess I was supposed to observe that he was getting ready to hit the road. <laughs> So for all of those reasons, I was given a committee of evidence, which is essentially in Scientology an evidentiary, evidentiary hearing by your peers, where you're presumed guilty at the outset and dished out punishment for months and months to, to fix yourself. Comment. Guilty, 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 guilty. Maybe not guilty. Those are the, those are the recommendations. <laughs> Finding and recommendations. They'll throw it a token. Well, she was trying, so you know that's more yeah. a bone. We're gonna not. You're not guilty on this one thing that we thought you were probably guilty on. <laughs> oh my gosh. Anyway, so for all of those reasons, I was. Yeah, I was in the in deep trouble for Marty escaping. Yeah. So then, in 2004, like in in the early 2000s, uh, well. Throughout all the 90s, David Miscavige was thoroughly unhinged throughout yes. all of the 1990s. And but, somehow and somehow you brought that out in him, either, yeah. either good or bad. Like Mark was either <laughs> incredibly doing amazing and David Miscavige talked to him all the time or he was underneath the world and restricted yeah. to the property and having and I couldn't talk to him so it was it was never it was never just a happy medium and the funniest was when so when I first got into RTC and realized that this was becoming a problem like you were <laughs> when you would get in trouble I would I would get fallout from this and I remember one time we were having a conversation and I was trying to explain to you and I'm not very good with analogies all the time but in this case I'll never forget I was like Mark it's like as if I were the president of the United States and you're up to no good. And you just looked at me and you're like, so now you're the president? <laughs> yeah. I was like, oh, now you're the president. Like, no, no, that's not uh, what I'm trying to say. I'm the first, I'm the first, what do they call it? The f I'm the first mister. <laughs> oh, now you're the president. I'm the first mister. I see how it is. I Needless get it. Needless to say, my effort failed miserably in that. In that. Okay. Anyhow. So, but in 2000, in the, in the, well, in 1999, when we were about to produce the New Year's 2000 event, so New Year's 1990 slash 2000, 1999 slash 2000, um, we did not party like it was 1999. It no. was, it was a bloodbath <laughs> at the international headquarters for basic, for, the last half of 1999 was David Miscavige saying, you guys are going to screw up this event. This event is going to be the biggest, most messed up event you guys have ever produced. And I'm going to have to do all the work and everything's going to be horrible. And you guys are going to make me stay up all night and all day. Well, we stayed up for the entire six months leading up into that event. And that event was a total nightmare and totally went horribly wrong. And we spent the next four years paying for that horrible event because after that, David Miscavige just went all out insane asylum full time for the next four years. And that's when tons and tons of people just couldn't take it. That's when Marty blew. That's when I left. I, all these different people started just breaking out of that place because David Miscavige was unhinged. Maybe so, for today we should finish with my story from 1999, which is sure. when, I, when I broke my leg. Okay, great. That's a perfect idea. Okay. And then we'll answer some questions and we'll get out of here. It's already been, uh, it's already been a, a buck twenty. So we've been going for a while here. So Hour should we 20. save that story for another day then? 
Yeah, maybe we just do go to straight to questions now okay, because good. we still got to talk about. We'll just do all the RTC stuff, all the RTC stories, um, as the last video. Yep. Okay. Awesome. If you guys haven't subscribed, we're trying to get to twenty one thousand subscribers today. We're at twenty thousand seven hundred and twenty seven. So if you haven't subscribed, click subscribe. We need to get to twenty one thousand, and. Um, yeah, somebody said Claire's secret Leosa. She's amazing. <laughs> I'm going to tell you right now. What? I'm convinced that she's not. So if she is, she is doing really, really good. Okay. Have you? Did you start any questions? No. Okay. Well, I start a bunch, so we'll okay. go through those. If you see any that you'd like to answer, then go ahead. But I'm going to start. We're going to we're going to do a, a lightning round. We're going to just start racking through these. So right now it is. Let's say it's 125. No questions past 125 will be answered. We're locking them in. Okay. Oh, look. Apostate Alex is here. Yay. He says, Sharon Kloss was ED of London when I was there. Susan Chalmers was the PES. The PES. Which is public exec sec, which is basically the, pers the executive that's over bringing all new people into the organization, recruiting new Scientologists. And that's right. Book thanks for the question, and, Alex. Yeah, thank you, Alex. Okay, thanks for joining uh, us. Yeah, thanks for tuning in. He was he was on last night, I think, with us as well. Yes. Um, Kristen Kirk says at Goldie, were you ever in Scientology? Are you just a pissed off never in? Um, I don't think Goldie was ever in Scientology. Goldie is she's just an activist. I think she enjoys these things. We love but, Goldie. But uh, Goldie's amazing. Yes. And uh, here's Goldie. We put it in the description, but she put a link in the comments to um, Alex's uh, apostate Alex's uh, new YouTube channel. So that's fun. Okay. Um, Bell on wheels. You have said COS uh, Church of Scientology tracked you by and listened in mm -hmm. on your cell phone calls. Were these on your own church supplied phones? Well, um, I'll answer that too. So when you, we worked for Scientology, we had cell phones and they could see who you were calling, but we mainly, because they were, they were not ours. They yeah, were they, provided by them. They were paid for by them. Um, they, they were just given to us to use as staff members, but because of that, they had complete access while we yeah. were the C organization to all of our phone records. And we mostly just used them for chirping, like as radios, as yes. walkie talkies, not as if you called out an outside line and you didn't have approval to call out, usually you just wouldn't be able to make the call. The phone didn't have that function. Um, but if you did have that function, like you, like sometimes I, I was, a on a film crew and I would go out to different places. I had a cell phone I could call anywhere. But if I called somebody I wasn't supposed to call, they would find out very quickly and I would get in big trouble. So you dared not misuse the phone. Um, otherwise, you would have it taken away from you. Yeah, and then part two to that question is how they got the phone records after we left. Oh, yeah, so when we left, they just called up Sprint or they had somebody who worked at Sprint like an inside person and they paid that person that person gave them our phone records or the person could have been a Scientology and just gave them over to them for free. That's but, why um, we left Sprint because we kept yeah. getting letters saying, as you requested, we sent your phone records to blah, blah, blah. Yeah, we're like, like what? We and, didn't request anything, you maniacs. And again, of course, they knew all of our personal information. So when you call up Sprint and they say, well, what are the last four digits of your social security number? What's your mother's maiden name? All of that. They knew all of that. So much so that at one point I was researching. Um, Getting new socials. Yeah. The equivalent of witness protection kind of thing. Yeah. It was yeah. ridiculous. Yeah. Was. Scientology, when you join the C organization, you fill out a form called the life history form. And you have to write up every single thing that's happened in your entire life, including mother's maiden name, social security, um, all any things that they would all the questions that they ask you when you try to verify so, someone's identity. Those are all listed in your life history. So Scientology can use those to track you through your bank transactions or your phone calls or whatever it is they might need. Yeah, Mike Rinder just commented in the comments saying private investigators had people in every phone company that they paid to get yes. people's phone records. There you go. There you there go. go. Mike Thanks for joining knows, us, Mike. <laughs> Mike knows better than anybody. Sure. Yep. 
Okay, this is quick here. Uh, Lumster's Mouse, Alberta, Canada. Thank you, Alberta, Canada. Have never been in a cult. Reading BFG now. Very grateful for the glossary at the back. I don't speak Scientology, and I find that very helpful. That's true. My book, I think, was the very first um, X base staff expose, whatever Scientology expose, to have a glossary. So I define most of the abbreviations and terms in. Uh, that are used in the book because in Scientology you're never supposed to go past a misunderstood word. And it was intentional to be authentic so that people in yes. Scientology would know that this actually was happening at the headquarters. Yes. I think I'll, I'll take the different approach of just trying to make it understandable by any anybody anywhere. <laughs> yes. Uh, Linda says it's shameful that YouTube demonetizes because a woman tells about something. Well, yes, I am. I agree. Yeah. Um, it's the world we live in. YouTube is really cracking down. Like, even the video that we did last night was demonetized before it was over. It was done. They they killed it. But um, so yeah, we try to play along and and just use different words and still try to tell the story. But it is what yeah. it is. Uh, Juliana, thank you, Juliana. She's a frequent flyer here. She says, oh, yes. Mark, I was thinking about opening a mission here in my city. You've just shattered my dreams. Okay, well, there you go. That's my job. <laughs> they, the people that drink the Kool-Aid, I pee in that Kool-Aid, and I tell you, please stop drinking it. Uh, okay, Mel says, hi, Mark and Claire. What are the businesses you both run as your main jobs, and how do you find time for everything you do? I presume you're both used to very little sleep, and that is still the case. Uh, we are definitely programmed that way. Um, Claire has a company that does bookkeeping all over for companies all over the United States, and I have an audiovisual uh, design and integration firm that designs interactives and video walls and audiovisual systems for museums, visitor centers, and um, like high-end uh, corporate or museum locations. In other words, Mark does the fun stuff and I do the boring stuff, but we both love what we do, so it's all good. <laughs> yes, we keep very, very busy. We sure do. Um, Pokey SD says, I just found out there's a South Carolina mission in Harle oh, uh, oh, a Scientology, Scientology mission in Harlingen, Texas. I believe in Brownsville. I think I Mike Render is going to pay a visit. <laughs> I don't uh... think so. Um, <laughs> Yeah, there might be. Again, missions are tiny and usually empty and run by one or two or a handful of people at best. Uh, Mary Jean Fitzgerald McCarthy says, hi, Mike and Claire. Hi. Hi. Thanks for okay. joining us. Um, Kim DeHay Denver, at Denver Steve. I'm also from Highlands Ranch. Oh, Go Douglas nice. County. Douglas yeah, County Douglas in the County house. Douglas County in the house. Uh, hi, Kim. Okay. <laughs> Taylon37 says, declare me as well. I've read Jenna's, Leah's, Mike's, and now Mark's books. And I love my SP Bling. And thank I have you. my SP Bling. And I have. Yay, Talon. Thank Yay, you. Yay, Talon. Thank you. Okay, Tim Smith says, my grandparents used to live in Hemet. <laughs> So I have been by the Amp Base. Yes, Hemet is right next. Hemet, California, and San Jacinto, California, are the nearby towns that uh, border the international headquarters. Richie Pound says that creates the zoned out look on the Scientologists. Yes, that's think, the training routines. The yes, absolutely. Drills, yes. Yeah, so Scientologists can not that you you can tell a Scientology some Scientologist something, and they can just not react. Or they can have sort of a glassed, uh, glassed over look sometimes. Okay. Um, oh, I accidentally killed one of those comments that I had starred. Sorry about that. Love Food Kitchen. Thanks for coming back. This is absolutely fascinating. Claire's story rivals any other ex-members I've heard. The book, when it eventually gets done, is going to be absolutely dynamite. There you go. Thank you very much. And and full disclosure, like, I, like I've said several times, some of these things I've never said out loud, period. So there you go. Oh, here's one. Here's a uh, Denver in uh, Denver airport getting some shade. Denver airport equals worst turbulence of anywhere I've flown every time. Uh, but love the city. But love the city. Well, yeah, we love uh, Colorado. High and, altitude. Uh, you get everything that comes with that. That's right. You got to get <laughs> in. They don't call us the mile high city for nothing. <laughs> okay, here's a good one. Uh, Lydia Von Stretchclaw. Uh, this is one of her comments was the one I deleted. So at least I'm getting this one in. Okay. Um, Marx was the first ex Scientologist books I've read. I was shocked. Although I also laughed a lot. I really admire both of them. Thank you. Thank you. Again, I always put out the disclaimer. I'm not a writer and I haven't even read many books. 
So for everybody who can get m through my book, and uh, I appreciate it. And if you get something out of it, awesome. Thank you. Uh, Carol Donaldson says, hi, Claire and Mark. Question, do the ones watching your videos actually show them to DM, or do you think they would leave knowing all the info these videos provide? Uh, we have had some people who have left. Um, there have been stories of people that used to work for the Office of Special Affairs Internet Office or Internet Unit, and uh, they, they activated some public members to kind of help them combat stuff on the Internet. And there are stories of those people eventually uh, leaving Scientology. Um, the OSA guys, I think, for the most part, they transcribe these things and they but, they but, might highlight yeah. any key things that David Miscavige might want to hear. But what were you going to say, Claire? Yeah, by my observation, Miscavige had a strange obsession with watching um, and listening to a lot of because he wanted to know what people were saying about him. So he would go in a closed room and watch the stuff himself, even though OSA would also provide summaries. I know a lot of it he was watching directly and that's also true from when we were doing our lawsuit and they were live streaming to him and he was directing them on what to say yeah that is true they did uh, live stream our depositions and our lawsuits so david miscavige could watch live um okay this one um from what i ha understand claire now offers bookkeeping services where did she learn about that <clears throat> yep i was um so let's see in I February, <laughs> huh? Yeah, no, in February, 2006, um, when I was, that's the month I gave birth to my son and we were both working in the corporate world. Um, Mark had a great paying job and they shut down his entire department. <clears throat> so February, the month that our first son was born, we started three companies. Um, one of the people we were working with gave, gave me QuickBooks software. And I, so I started doing all the training courses on QuickBooks and I discovered that I, I I've always had a love of numbers despite my formal schooling, uh, lack of formal schooling, I should say, sorry, I'm getting tired now, but, um, I, so I started getting certifications in QuickBooks and just discovered that I love it. And it's kind of grown from there. Awesome. Okay, um, here we go. Uh, another one from uh, Julia says, um, Mark's book was already very, uh, what Mark's book was already emotional, even though I already knew a lot of the stories and David Miscavige's BS. Yeah, yeah I mean, I tried to make the story as real as possible and highlight as many things, but um, it is what it is. Yes. Um, I'm trying to get um, the UK people. I'm looking for pounds. Oh, here's we. I, there was a bunch of super chats. I was like, well, I'm going to look for the pound super chats or the, oh, nice. the euro super chats. Um, Simon says, I, I love Claire so much. I was approached by Scientology near the MCR Manchester, Uni. U oh. Manchester University. Okay. But Ma Man Manny Uwe, the Manchester Uni. Yes. Um, you are well adjusted now. But were you more Sea Org like as executives? Yes. Thanks for joining us, Simon, all the way from UK. Yay! Uh, yes, we were we were like Sea Org executives. And uh, when we get into the RTC stories, we can tell about how I, I was ripping into Norman Starkey one time when you came up to RTC. <laughs> yes, I went. I heard I was. <laughs> I was going up there to deliver something or some submission or proposal that I had to go to David Miscavige, and I heard somebody yelling at somebody, and I was like, oh, man, this person's getting ripped up. And then when I opened the door to the office, it was Claire that was doing the yelling, and I was like, oh, my Not God. Not proud of that. Unfortunately, it was a rip or get ripped world. Dog, yeah. dog, you either do what you're told I had never heard her yell like that before never i thought i didn't even recognize the person who was yelling i didn't even recognize the voice and i was like oh boy yikes and then later on i was like look at you meanie oh my god and she was yelling at norman starkey who's the sea org member he's been a sea org member his entire life he used to be the captain of one of the ships when he would see around with hubbard in the in the sea org in the 60s and here my wife is ripping his face off, yelling at him like, oh not a moment God. I'm proud of. To be clear, I, I was under threat of getting <sighs> him to conform or myself go to the rehabilitation project for. So there you go. 
Yeah. Ms. says, Claire, did I understand correctly that your mom signed over legal guardianship of you to Scientology? Yes, that is correct, Ms. That's absolutely what happened when I was 16 years old. She signed over guardianship of me to someone she had never met and with no knowledge of where I was going to be working even physically. So, Yeah. Fabian says, to which extent are BTs able to influence people's behavior and personality? How did you know that Mark himself and Mark was that himself. was Mark himself and not the BT on his left elbow? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so he, Fabian, thank you, Fabian. Fabian is making a reference to the, uh, the Xenu, the Lord Xenu Scientology story, which is all these millions and trillions of beings from all these other planets in the, in the galactic confederacy that was overpopulated were brought to Earth and dumped in volcanoes, and then their souls, which were called body thetans, BTs, were attached to people. And in Scientology, they tell you when you're learning about these body things, that they are the things that are affecting your bad behaviors and that because um, those body things are the ones that are affecting you, if you get rid of them, then you will become free of these negative influences. Now, for all the Scientologists that are watching, you're like, that is 100% not what they tell you in Scientology. It is when you get to OT3, that is the wall of fire that they call the secret OT level. You will absolutely learn about body thetans and Lord Xenu and all of this nonsense on OT3. So we've saved you the trouble. You can just stop doing any of that nonsense and spend your money on your family and personal uh, uh, development of yourself without um, having to worry about auditing off your body things. Yep. The, a very elaborate version of the Emperor's New Clothes for you. Yes, and if you think we're lying, you can watch the South Park episode called Trapped in the Closet where they explain all of this and Scientology went nuts because it was true. Okay, next. Woo! Um, Lydia again, how do I, there's certain people that get a lot of questions in for some, I am super impressed on how this little country is representing this even. Oh yes, we did have yes. a lot of comments. Um, I'm trying to find more of them, but I don't, it's hard for me to know unless you say you're from somewhere. I don't know that you're from somewhere. Oh, um, here's one. Julia says DM boasts of standing tall, but Mark and Claire are standing in their light. Thank you. The light you. express exposes shadow. Thank you for the being the beacons of light. You shine so bright. Never forget. We love you. Oh, well, thank you. Thank Julia. You. Well, that was that very nice. That's very kind. Um, oh, look at David Price. Uh, you guys should do an interview with Kate Olson. I watched Aaron's interview with her, and I would like to see how she's doing. Yes, okay, I'll well, do. I'll do that. I'll I'll sign up for that. Perfect. Claire can do that while I when I have to go off to my job. We're already talking about Claire's. Claire's going to take over the channel, and I'm just going to go back to doing my day job. <laughs> no, I'm and, not. Uh, but I'm going to do this. Here I'm we go. Help. Hey guys, watching from Scotland. Don't catch many live streams, but love the shows. Thank Yay. you. We're doing this just for the people who always say they don't catch a live stream. We're like, okay, we're going to do one super early on Sunday so we can uh, they can squeeze it in before they have to go to bed over there. It's on our bucket list to visit Scotland and Ireland. Yes. Oh, wow, Miz. Thank you for the super sticker. Oh, thank you, Miz. Um, JM, the Oregon one is where TC's children went to. Yes, this is true. The school in the Scientology school located in Sheridan, Oregon, is where Tom Cruise's children went when when they were learning how to study Scientology. That's just, that's where they learned it. There's also a lot of other famous Scientologists that have gone to that school. Mark Newman, yeah. how is there a Church of Scientology in my hometown of Battle Creek? The only thing that is there is Kellogg's and Post. Kellogg's is moving their headquarters from Battle Creek to Chicago. I heard about that. We know some people that have some Airbnbs uh, near uh, Kellogg's plant. So we have heard a, a, a few, some grumblings of that sort of stuff. Um, I think... I can't remember who I, I want to say it was Kirstie Alley. There's some um, Scientology celebrity that has some sort of connection to Battle Creek. And I think that is the only reason why they put one there. And I'm pretty sure it was, well, Kirstie was Wichita. I'm That's not right. sure. 
I'm not sure yeah. what the Battle Creek connection was, but somebody thought they should get somebody there, and Scientology had very, very high expectations of getting everyone that worked at Kellogg's into Scientology for some reason. I think they uh, they want to get uh, some discounts on Raisin Bran or something. I'm not sure what's going on over there. Um, okay. Um, Lauren says, yes, it was called the O levels at the time. Yes, that okay, was good. in regards to my mom's education level. There you go. Um, Richie Pound said, saw her in dazed and confused last week. You must be talking about Marissa. Marissa, uh, the girl that was Claire's friend and my former girlfriend, she had a big fro, a blonde fro or red fro, depending on when. And she was in a movie called Dazed and Confused. Um, okay. You want me to mute you? Was that you? Somebody calling your name over there? It was a kiddo in the background. Oh, this, I hear I see hair munchkins. Uh, Mark, did you go out to D with Marissa? No, I did not. Um, we were little kids at the time, and I don't think very much of anything happened between the two of us. I think there might have been some <laughs> kissing if I was lucky. Um, is Julia McGinnis still a Scientologist? I don't know. I know her daughter, Martina... Um, was doing some courses in Scientology and her little daughter, there was a, a young little daughter, I can't remember her name right off the bat. My sister was very good friends with um, uh, Julia McGinnis is a fa very famous opera, sarmer, opera singer and I think she was in a many Broadway shows and operas and I want to say she played Carmen um, the, in, a, uh, in the play. She's very famous, Julia. I mean, in the opera world, I guess she's n n has notability um and she had two daughters and i think one of the daughters was in the sea organization in los angeles and i don't i want to say that it didn't end well for that daughter yeah um mark don't say sec checker too fast lol oh okay i guess it sounds like something else um okay. mark do you still eat danish i love me a danish um okay the good thing that came out of all this craziness is that you two meet, met each other and you're close friends yes that is true we do have many friends and people we consider family love food kitchen honestly is there anyone alive anywhere more creepy than tommy davies tommy davis everything i've seen of him makes me deeply um makes, makes him, him seem deeply unpleasant and somehow quite sinister yeah. yes him and miscavige birds of a feather flock together oh yeah he's not a he, tommy davis the funny thing about tommy davis is there are many recordings of tommy davis where he's basically sticking up for david miscavige in super appropriate times where he shouldn't be doing so like i think one time somebody compared um david miscavige to Dr. Martin Luther King and Tommy Davis went off. How dare they compare David Miscavige to Martin Luther King? Like, that's not a good comparison. David Miscavige is so much more important and so much a higher, better person than uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. You're just like, what are you, what are you saying, Tommy? Are you yeah. insane? Or another great example of Tommy Davis being completely insane is when he was on CNN and told the entire world that there's no such thing as disconnection in Scientology. Yes, he, Tommy Davis. <laughs> um, um, so he, he did that for many years. He stuck up for David Miscavige. And David Miscavige was not nice to Tommy Davis. There's, oh, no. it, the, the only times I ever saw Tommy Davis interact with uh, David Miscavige directly when I was there, it was always Dave yelling at Tony, uh, Tommy, Tommy, telling him he, he was uh, you know, trying to kind of schmooze and get into Tom Cruise circle. And it was always accusatory. And a lot of times, the only reason we would even see Tommy Davis at the end base is if he was there getting sec checks and being investigated. Those were the few times he would come and stay for the internet at the international headquarters for any amount of time. So it's very funny that now Tommy Davis, not in Scientology, not in the Sea Organization, he blew, he ended up escaping. He divorced his Scientology wife, married a non-Scientologist, a wog, as Scientologists call it, and he basically has no association with Scientology besides through his mother and stepfather, who Tommy is Davis, Ann, Ar Ann Archer and Terry Drastro. Tommy Davis' wife was sent to the Rehabilitation Project Force for flirting with Tom Cruise. Yes, that's true. 
Oh my God, there, we have so many Tommy stories. We got to keep going. Yes. Okay, I've seen Claire's name many times, but I think this is the first time I've actually seen her. Well, there she is, right there. Get get your nice get to a, meet get you. a good Thanks look. Thanks for joining us here. <laughs> same okay. old, same old. <laughs> How does Scientology make money off Sea Org members? Um, it's not really that they make money; it's that they don't spend money. So Sea Org members are Sea Org members are sent essentially the management of all of Scientology organizationally, internationally. Um, sea Org members are the ones that are managing all that and making millions and millions of dollars. Well, the well, also the Sea Org members, though, are the counselors that deliver the levels that people pay thousands and thousands of dollars for while making while the, the while the person doing the actual execution of the counseling is making forty six dollars a week. Yeah. So at the flag service organization or or flag or the the big buildings in Clearwater, Florida, when we were still there in the mid 2000s, um, they would make a million dollars a week in Florida, in Clearwater, a million dollars a week. And that's all Sea Org members. I want to say 1,500. Aaron has the exact breakdown, but it's probably somewhere around 1,500 Sea Org members that work in Clearwater and they generate a million dollars and they make coincident. Well, in Clearwater, they make a million dollars a week. That's more than every other Scientology organization in the world combined. What they all other ones make total, uh, Florida Clearwater makes more than all of them combined. So they maybe make five hundred to five hundred to a million dollars a week. Everyone else, so the Sea Org members essentially are gener generating at least a million, and then where they do make the next, the second largest amounts are at the Sea uh, Org uh, advanced organizations in in Europe and in Los Angeles and in uh, different uh, UK. At these different organizations, they maybe make a few, maybe 100,000 a week or something like that, or maybe even 80,000. But hey, um, let me help with housekeeping for, housekeeping for a second. Yeah. I see we have 1,070 people watching. Yay! Don't forget to hit the like button. Well, they're watching or they've commented. But yes, we, okay. we do have a lot of people in here. And That's if you awesome. haven't subscribed, we're at 20,737. So we we need about a little over 250 uh, more subscribers and we can hit 21,000 subscribers, which we're still trying to do. And I, I don't, don't want to have to assign Mark lower conditions for yeah, failing for, to meet for, his statistical get goals. My, get my, uh, <laughs> uh, Gail Walker says, man, that's a lot of bureaucracy. Yeah. Yeah, yes, it is a lot of bureaucracy. Um, that's crazy. Um, that's crazy. Kids don't know what they're doing. Oh my God. Yeah. I think that was in relation to the children doing the, um, confessionals, uh, uh interrogating. Yeah. The, um, or signing contracts or being involved in a cult. Any, any of the things we've been talking about involving exactly. kids. Yep. Trevanon says Dutch guy here. Thanks Trevanon. Hello. Thanks for joining us. Um, Amanda Martin says hi from Ireland. Yay. Another place we want to go to. Yes. Um, we're get we got to go back every few years. We got to go back and see Claire's people, and um, so we think we're gonna go either some later this year or next year. We'll we'll go. Yeah. Um, oh, there's such a good story behind this. Richie Pound, um, oh, yeah. uh, blown for good. Is Art Linson Jenny Linson's father a Scientologist film producer? I don't know that he's a Scientologist uh, currently, or he has any activity in Scientology. Um, Art Linson. And his son, John Linson, are the producers of a TV show called Yellowstone. Um, actually, one of my favorite shows. And uh, John Linson is a producer and Art Linson's a producer. Art Linson's daughter, Jenny Linson, is one of the famous inchwives on the she, TV. She's in the picture that Richie Pound has. Okay, great. That's Jenny. Um, awesome. Um, the, um, the <laughs> CNN show, the CNN show, history a culture, of history of history yeah. or culture of violence, a history of violence. By, okay. Um, Scientology, Cooper. a history of violence. Yeah. It's an Anderson, C Anderson Cooper, CNN show. Jenny Linson is on that show. We'll see if we can dig it up 
if there's a, a link to it, we'll put it in the description if we can find one. And she, you can see who Jenny Linson is, folks. And to my I, knowledge, Art Linson was in Scientology, but is no longer. That's what I know to be true. Okay, I good. I don't know what current status is. Okay. And we are going to do a video um, that they are both related to in one of the spy files because there's a huge thing that went down and um, some Scientologists got uh, a lot of – hundreds and hundreds of Scientologists lost millions and millions of dollars. Um, and they were all scammed by another Scientologist. So at some point we'll, uh, we'll do a video about that. Uh, Joker71 says, Mace Kingsley hides school and the whole troubled teen industry is full of abuses. Yeah, Absolutely. Scientology does not do well um, taking care or – monitoring teenagers they seem to be very horrible at that okay we don't have much time left but i'm going to try to answer answer as many uh questions as we can get to uh ms again says amazing amount of mental and physical uh, abuse uh endured just a disgrace that the u.s government still gives scientology a tax exemption yeah that's what we're working on we're trying to open people's eyes and uh you know at least uh notify tech uh uh, law enforcement and politicians and government officials that these guys should not be getting a free ride. Um, Ann says Daniel, uh, Daniel Q, Dan, Q, Daniel Sander. Claire has such long hair on the pick. Oh, yep. yes. Thank you, Ann. Yes, she does. Claire's hair used to be past her uh, backside. It was a very, very long. <laughs> I didn't have much access to hairdressers <laughs> being in the C organization. I decided to just let it grow out. In fact, you cut it for a few years. You just give me trims. Yes. Miss D, my son went to Delphi for a short time in the late 80s. I took him out when we moved to Burbank. Good move, Miss D. Good yeah. school system at no cost. Yes. Yeah, that's when I went to Delphi, so I probably know your son. Um, okay. Um, Somebody asked if David Miscavige has kids. The answer to that question is no. No, he doesn't have kids. Um, Anthony Spurgeon. Thank you, Anthony. He says, who plays you two in the movie about your escape? Oh, I don't know, man. Um, it's it's going to have to be somebody. Uh, gonna, I don't know. Uh, what's her name could play Claire? That girl from um, the chess, the chess girl, Queen's Gambit. Oh, yeah. Anna Taylor Joy. Is that her yeah. name? Yeah. I like her. She should play you, Claire. Okay. Um, and then, um, yeah, Russell, Russell Crowe can play me now cause he put on a little weight. So he matches up to me now. <laughs> um, okay. Steve, uh, Stephen Graham, that sounds a uh, Grafam, 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 um, sounds like a UK. Um, can't imagine what LRH would do if to DM, DM, oh, to DM if, if he, he came, came back. back. What do you think? Uh, what, what? what did you do to my cult? <laughs> I'm telling you, Claire will curse. Claire will say words that YouTube doesn't like. I tell her not to before every video, and every video she does it anyway. And she acts like she's such a sweet, innocent, like, oh, ooh, ooh, ooh. but she does it every time. Every time. I was reading his comment. <laughs> I I'm know. Sorry. But I didn't say I was reading it too. I didn't say it. Um, I, I'm uh, a newbie, honey. If L. Ron Hubbard came back, he would be so mad at Dave Miscavige. He would be so mad. Um, one of the rules that L. Ron Hubbard made is that anything that he wrote could not be changed. And David Miscavige has been changing the stuff he wrote for the last 30 years on a nonstop basis. And everybody seems to go along with it. And L. Ron Hubbard would be really mad. That's what I think. Yep. Um, John Brock says, I was in a secret unit in the CMO straight to the RPF. I believe that. Sure. Yeah. There's, there's things like that that happened all the time. Yep. They'd have these secret <laughs> units and then they'd be working on something super, super secret and then they'd mess it up and then they'd all end up on the RPF. Yep. Um, Lydia Von Stretchkow, at this rate, I'm certain I will be crying through Claire's book when it's out. Well, she has to write the thing first. Yeah. Um, Thank you for being willing to read it. <laughs> here's a good one. JM, are they still having minors sign contracts? I'm pretty sure they are. Yeah. We We thought that they stopped, but we heard... Um, we heard of somebody that joined when they were 14, joined, started working when they were 14 just a few years ago. Yeah. Um, finally got to see you live. Thank you, Newt. We appreciate it. We tried. Thanks we for tried joining to, us. People, we got a lot of requests. I've really been enjoying hearing Claire's story. Super interesting. Thank, Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Julie. 
Um, we're go- we're busting through these. We don't have that many left, and we're gonna awesome. uh, try to finish in the next uh, several minutes here. Perfect. Um, okay. Um, thanks both for doing the er- the early live. I'm from UK, and just want to say your stories are mind boggling, and I'm amazed how you seem such kind and nice and level headed people. Well, we try. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, we're a little bit the worse for wear from from doing back to back here. Oh, I know. Have to I'm go gonna recover. I I don't think I'm gonna be able. I'm, I might have to rest my voice for the rest of the day up to the next uh, live tomorrow Monday. Yeah. I'm going to go crawl into a hole. Mark Newman says, legally, <laughs> don't you have to be 18 as, to sign a contract? Yeah. There's a lot of things you have to legally do that they don't kind of follow the rules of in Scientology. I remember seeing a massive building in the middle of nowhere in Oregon. Went to, went home and looked it up. Delphi. Yep, yep. In Sheridan. It's up on a hill. And it's just in the middle of nowhere. There's like a, it's like Hogwarts. It's Scientology Hogwarts. It's this big <laughs> Hogwarts looking building just on the hillside and there's all these Scientologists flying around practicing uh, Xenu k- space cootie music uh, uh, m- magic on each, uh, each so other. That reminds me somebody made a great suggestion that we should make a shirt that in in honor of Hogwarts it says OT nine and three quarters. <laughs> you had to you guys had you had to be there. I guess you had to be there. Anyone uh, who's read Harry Potter knows. I know, I'm talking I know. About. Retro. That's like the train thing where they get they go the platform this platform. Yeah. 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 OK. OK. Yeah, yeah. Retro Bob says people often ask about LRH coming back, but don't Scientologists <laughs> think it's weird that no one at all has come back remembering. I know it's <laughs> you're going to make me it's call. A study a study in contradictions in Scientology. One hundred percent. All of it from beginning to end. If you actually start asking questions, the house of cards falls down very quickly. Yeah, the cognitive dissonance that you have to have in Scientology is very, very, very heavy. Like yeah. you have to, you have to overlook so many things on a full time basis. Like no, 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 no. If that was the case, then this whole thing be a scam. <laughs> yeah, that's why yeah. they train you as a Scientologist that critical thoughts are a bad thing and that you're only having them because you've done bad things. That way, you'll quickly learn not to ask any questions, and that's just the way it is. The status quo. Don't ask any questions. Yeah. Okay. Uh, last few here. Let me just see. I'm trying to find any that I that had UK in the or EU or any of those things. Um, okay. Juliana says, exposing since 2006, that was you and Claire at Gold and Art to See. Yes, that was. Yes. Uh, that was one of. That's us. Those pictures. That's us. Uh, we do have some other pictures. Somebody actually found the pictures that were the Scientology entered into deposition and all of the pictures that they gave us, we didn't have any of those. And when they put them in our court case, they put these watermarks all over them. So we couldn't really use them, but uh, somebody scanned those and removed all the watermarks and sent them to us. So it was really nice. Yes. Um, Denver Steve-O says, hi, Osa begging you, please declare me an SP. You bite. I love Claire, Mark, Mike, Leah, and everyone fighting to make your lives difficult. Davy Boy is a tiny little troll with a tiny little troll dingus. Xenu is my homeboy. Oh, dingus. Yes. You can say dingus on YouTube. Nobody cares. Okay. Dingus, dingus, dingus. Okay. There we go. Thank you, Denver Stevo. Um, Trevanon says um, David Miscavige already thought, thought Mark would blow for good. Oh, that, I think that was in relation to um, him not wanting us to be married. Um, David Miscavige, um, the reason he didn't like it when I was um, with Claire is because I was in Golden Era Productions and Claire was religi- in Religious Technology Center. And he in, in um, basically, um, he believed that anyone in RTC that was married to somebody with gold was sleeping with the enemy. Because if you weren't in his circle, you were the enemy. And he said that hundreds and hundreds of times to us you are sleeping with the enemy and looking at me <laughs> yep so yeah fun super fun cat is- cat cat and maggie made a hilarious comment she says dingus does not ding us okay there we go <laughs> there was one last super chat that i saw and i was going to get that one and that's going to be the last one we're going to do uh, merch okay. idea shirt saying OT nine escape Scientology. That's a good one, Heather. We have heard that one many times before. OT nine. 
Yeah, OT nine and ten are the the first two levels of leaving Scientology. I finished the bridge to total freedom and got the heck out of Scientology. Yes, exactly. Okay, good. Well, I think that's going to wrap it up for today. That was uh, we were on for two hours, guys. So that was a lot of live. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, if you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. We're trying to get up to yes. twenty one thousand. I wish we would have done it here in the live today. But hopefully we'll be able to scoop them up in the replay. We're right now we're at uh, 20,743 subscribers is where we currently stand. We're trying to get to 80,000 subscribers by March 13th, L. Ron Hubbard's birthday, to give him a very good present for the birthday game. And, um, yeah, and we are going to do a video about the birthday game because Claire um, has some really good stories um, that she reminded me of about some people that were some very big birthday game uh, birthday game players and winners like one organization that won every single year had a very famous person that stuff happened to so we're going to do a whole video about that and uh thank you the person from germany um that wrote in about that we're definitely going to talk about vipka hansen from hamburg org and um we're gonna uh we'll de definitely do a whole video on that whole saga but um, yeah, so if you uh, if you want to get a, a book, if you want to find out more about Scientology, we in my book, Blown for Good, Behind the Iron Curtain of Scientology, I talk about um, how I got into Scientology, just my formative years, and then the 15 years that I worked at the international headquarters with David Miscavige. There's all sorts of insane stories about that place and how it runs and what are the workings of it and the day-to-day -day activities and the schedule and what we ate and where we ate and how we ate and, you know, all that happy hoo-ha. Um, and Claire and myself have both signed those copies of my book, If You Buy It Off, blowforgood.com. And um, otherwise, you can go to Amazon and get them on Kindle or um, Audible. Yeah, Kindle or Audible. And then um, if you want to get a bobblehead, a uh, Mike Rinder bobblehead or an SP bracelet, you can go to the spshop.com and all the funds there go to the after uh, go the proceeds from all of the things that we sell on the SP shop go to the Aftermath Foundation. And um, if you want to just directly support the Aftermath Foundation, you can go to the aftermathfoundation.org. And even if you don't have anything to donate, you can donate your time or you can um, volunteer to be um, assist if we're trying to have somebody escape or some we're trying to get somebody relocated that escaped from Scientology. Um, we have people that can a place there, a tab there. You can volunteer to um, be called upon if we need something. Or just share and help us educate people on the dangers of Scientology. Yeah. You yeah. can retweet. You can follow us. Go to in the link below is all our socials and all that good stuff in the uh, description of the video. Did I forget anything? I think we did pretty good today. No, did... thanks to thanks for to everyone who joined us and asked great questions. And uh, have a great day. Have a great night. Don't let the body thetans bite. Okay. Until next time. <laughs>